Yeah, you said body horror. Now I can't get out of that because now I just I'm just having a Kira flashbacks. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, body this is horror. the thing. I argue with people uh-huh. all the time that Akira is horror, and it's I horror. will fight people. I, I don't understand people who are like, "This is not horror." I'm like, "How Please? do you look at that and not have nightmares?" <laughs> Please join me in fighting beyond the butt. I'm Kat. And I'm Gabe. And And we're we're the the Ghouls Ghouls Next Next Door. Door. Talking about spooky stuff. As we do. Yes. Welcome. Uh, We are the horror analysis podcast, media analysis podcast from Horror Lens, where we discuss the psychological, historical, ecological, (laughs) scientific uh, reasoning behind our fears that influence our cinematic ones. And this month we are talking about Horror in anime, specifically. Yes. And and today, <laughs> Promise Neverland. Yes. Today we're going to be talking about Promise Neverland. And as promised from all of our episodes this month, we are bringing in friends to talk about it who are excited and have lots of really awesome insights and totally get why we do what we do. And so we're going to introduce you to Crystal Marie of Beyond the Bot. Hello. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for having me Welcome. here. Yes, of course. We're very excited. We're so pumped. We had Dory before. We're like, we need more. <laughs> we need to get. We're gonna, you know, get all of them at some point. <laughs> Most people on Beyond the Bot are asking, "Why are you there?" <laughs> no, really. Yes. Anybody who knows me is like, "Really, a horror podcast? You really?" Yes. Well, what can I say? It's it's a <laughs> shameful part of my life that maybe maybe I might accidentally be a horror fan, and I hadn't realized it until now. <laughs> yes, and that's what we love to hear. We love to enlighten people to, <laughs> to realize the horror fan within, <laughs> mm. <laughs> to confront yeah, them. Uh, mm-hmm. You know what? I'm a Gemini. It makes sense. I've got two personalities. One of them hates it, <laughs> really yeah. hates it, cries. Yeah. That That's the one most people know. And then there's apparently the other one who hides in a corner in shame, secretly dreaming about the Baba Duke or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just giddy. It's just giddy in their own little corner. It's so funny. Kat is a Gemini as well. And oh, yeah. we actually, our, our guest from last week also mentioned that they're a Gemini. And that's why it like influences their work. Let's see. You Geminis. Oh, my <laughs> God. Yep. Dual personalities. They mostly contrast. It's like, you thought you know me, but there's a whole other version that also exists. <laughs> it's like, yeah, there's the public aesthetic. And then there's, have you seen my private room? Wink, wink. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> the, what does Christian Grey call it? I don't know. It's like a gray room or something. Oh, yeah. Red room? Well, the dungeon, uh, I guess. No. My little dungeon where my crystal <laughs> ball and all my tarot and all my candles and stuff is. A little yeah. Bit of it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, stuff, exactly. Yeah. I'm like, I hate yes. ghosts. Now let me summon my grandmother because I need to ask her for advice. Can I cut my hair when the moon is full or not? This is <laughs> exactly, a real thing, exactly. by the way, in my country. I really like, wow. can you or can you not? For real, I wanted to go and like get my 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 like tips trimmed, like my hair tips, and my mother stopped me because the moon was waning. And she's like, and so you're not allowed during that. You're time? not supposed to do that because if you do that, your hair falls off. That's oh, some yes. Caribbean myth culture right there. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. oh, oh, okay. And my mom's like this hyper, like super Catholic woman, like does the rosary every week kind of thing. Didn't let yeah. me watch anime at first, like when she she was convinced Pikachu was a representation or an avatar of the devil. And that was like forbidden in my house. I used to do it like secretly. And, you know, it doesn't help that there are anime like, you know, 
I mean, have you seen some anime titles? The devil works as a part timer. My mom doesn't get that. You know, it's supposed yeah, to be yeah. funny. But, but it's like it's, she takes it literal. She's like, what do you mean? The devil is a part timer. And I'm like, mom, he works at a McDonald's or something. I don't know. And she's like, yes, it's true. McDonald's is the devil. I'm like, okay, this is a whole other conversation. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> But, yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah I my my aunt is religious, and she is like pretty much like my mom. She had a similar thing for that show Lucifer. Oh my god! And she's like, why are they making him like hot and cool? <laughs> and I was like, come on. <laughs> she's like, why are they making him like he's a good guy? <laughs> it's like, hold on. I'm like, mom, look at Lucifer's butt, though. <laughs> like, can you, I understand. Sin. So <laughs> mm. I get it. Mm-hmm. And now I am converted. <laughs> There's I no am turning back. A sinner. I see why you didn't want me to watch it. <laughs> it's too late, Mom. It's happened. <laughs> like um, but for our listeners who may not know who you are, which is really sad, and they really should get on their game, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. <laughs> Hi. Uh, um, yeah, no, I'm clearly very famous. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, I'm, I'm Chris Dalbury, and if you love anime, then you might have met me first in a channel on YouTube called Get in the Robot that we launched about three years ago. I think two years and a half, three years ago. And it used to be part of the family of channels on Frederator. So even before that, I was also doing gaming videos on the leaderboard, which is also part like a sister channel for getting the robot. Unfortunately, because, you know, COVID happened and the pandemic happened and things like that, um, uh, the, the entire kind of getting the robot leaderboard channels had to be shut down for a bit. And Unfortunately, we had to move on from the project, but we couldn't move on from our love of anime. So we decided to launch the exact same team that was on Getting the Robot. We just pulled together and made a collaborative and just launched a new channel called Beyond the Bot, which has been operating fully since last year. We are all, we're almost going to be a year, a year old. I think it's around July 4th. Yeah, we actually launched on Independence Day, our independent channel. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're really, I see what you did there. I see what you did there. We're so meta. Um, and, and yeah, we ever since then, we've kind of been also continuing to cover anime as what we are, which is essentially an anime club on YouTube. And we've got Dory there, who had already, who has already been here on the podcast. Um, Yadoye, Kurt, Wai Chang, and everybody else from the BTS crew, including Adrian, who's always behind the camera, um, Chantel, Alex, Jacob, Nikki, just a bunch of fun people from the bot who love to nerd out on all things anime. That's what I've been doing lately. And maybe you've also caught me on a new show called The Twist, which recently launched, where I essentially do kind of like a news of the web on that week. Okay. It's a weekly show. But I, I I integrate a lot of nerdiness into it because I, I, yeah, because I have to. We need to talk about <laughs> other things in the geek world, like Marvel, DC, and whatever happened with that Snyder's Cut. Um Yep. So, <laughs> why we needed it. <laughs> so yeah, so that's what I'm up to. And I also do an, an IG live series called Midnight Geek Diner, which is with Goboyano, which is another anime website. Um, and what I do at that time, we, we do it every Thursday at 11 p.m. on Instagram and then upload it on IG live. I mean, IG TV. Sorry, it's an IG live and then it goes on IG TV. And essentially <laughs> it's a midnight geek diner. So, you know, when you're in a, in a diner, like really, really late and the only one who's dropping yeah. by are people who work late night. So mm-hmm. all, all of us degenerates gather and discuss late night related stuff in the geek world, such as maybe, you know, a couple of um, late night anime, etchy and further, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't watch, you know what I mean? Yeah, you're, 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 yeah. you're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> so we, 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 exactly. we do that. We do that too. That's exciting. I am that trash, is so basically, is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> we welcome, we welcome trash. Uh, Thank we you. identify as trash as well. All uh, humans are trash. Yeah, it seems very, you know, yeah, that's true. All <laughs> humans are trash. Uh, very well rounded in your your geekdom and uh, <gasps> well what you love. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I like it balanced. My diet. Yes, 
or at least uh, quite a lot, a plethora, if you will, of Indeed. things to geek out about. <laughs> That's and right. So when we uh, approached you to uh, be on our show, you were like, I'm not a horror fan. Why would I do this? And then you got to thinking and you were like, Maybe or am is. I a horror fan? And I didn't know. <laughs> Maybe I be. <laughs> that was, yeah, I'm, I might cry. Because <laughs> part of the whole thing is that I have a fight going on right now in at Beyond the Bot with the rest of the bot gang. Because we all saw Paprika. Because we have a we we do the bot cast. And yeah. it's kind of like an anime movie club. And the first film we watched was Paprika, and I said it was horror. And yeah, it Yadoye, is. Mm-hmm. It, right? And Yadoye yeah. and Dory were yeah. like, no, that's not horror. I'm like, yes, it is. And it's it like, is it, literally on one of our videos, I am arguing halfway through the video. And they even cut that conversation out because it was way too long. But we're just <laughs> fighting in the middle of a video about anime reboots, about how Paprika is a horror. And I'm like, there are jump scares in it. And he's like, just because you jumped and you were scared doesn't mean that it's a jump scare. I'm like, that's exactly the definition of a jump scare. You jump because you're scared, a.k.a. jump scare. Because there's a doll hiding in a, in a closet and they open it and it's there. And it's like, I just freaking, I lost. So yeah. half the movie, like horror stuff happens and I am terrified. And I am yeah. an easily impressed person. Like I see an ad for Taco Bell. I'm buying tacos. I'm, 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 I'm terrible at this. Advertisements have me. They've got me by the by the cojones. I so, so so you can't put horror movies at me because I am traumatized for an entire week. Literally, the punishment for me at Beyond the Bot whenever I don't hand in a script on time or do my video on time is that I have to live stream or watch like the Blair Witch Project or they assign <laughs> a horror movie to me. That's my punishment. <laughs> so, yes. I am as shocked as they are that I am here after having realized that, in fact, my favorite anime last year was a horror anime. And my favorite books right now are horror books. I mean, it's not the only thing going on in them, but but essentially these are horror authors that I'm reading. And I'm like, oh, crap. Am I a horror fan? Yes. God damn it. Yes. No. (laughs) Come to the dark side. No. (laughs) We got Lucifer. I get it. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, that, and I think that's the thing about horror that people often forget or don't realize is that when they think of horror, they think of something like Blair Witch. They think of a jump scares. They think of Friday the 13th and, you know, mm-hmm. you know, Freddy versus Jason, those kinds of things where it's just like gory or it's just there like with, you know, hokey jump scares that are timed and with the... <laughs> <laughs> you know, the sound yeah. effects. I can literally, yeah. like, there's one scene that I feel if a, for, if, a, if a horror film doesn't have it, can it even be horror then? Which is when you're looking at, the character's looking at himself or herself in the mirror. They yes. turn away. They turn back into the mirror. And of course, something else is there. That yeah. is yes. the most terrifying trope to me. And I know it's overdone. The sh- and I don't care. I always jump. I hate it. I hate it so much. I hate it with a passion. I literally go to my house and every time after I watch a movie like that, I can't look at mirrors for at least two days. Yeah. Yeah. Even though you know it's coming. My favorite is when when they're like, they go to the fridge and the music is like opening because they open the fridge and you think, oh, when they close that fridge, it's going to be, and they close it, there's nothing there. But then they turn and there's something there. I hate that. (laughs) my favorite. I hate it all. (laughs) I hate all of it. I hate it when they cut the music. I hate it. Yeah. Oh my gosh, nothing I hate more than everything was fine and then suddenly there's no music and they're going down the stairs. Yeah. Or they're you're walking. Like, why? I'm like, <laughs> why are you doing this to me? Why am I watching this again? Why? Why am I doing this to myself? No. I don't learn. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. I, I think that's like a big part of it, right? Is that, you know, that, that that's what people are looking for is those jump scares. Not me. Um, but we often, <laughs> yeah. But we often cover, you know, content that isn't, that people would argue like, oh no, that's a thriller or that's a different kind. Like there are subgenres of horror, right? There are specific, you know, monsters or creatures that are being explored in horror that people don't realize that's a horrific concept, right? Like just thinking of any vampires, right? So you're saying <laughs> Twilight is a horror. <laughs> okay, yeah, Twilight Ooh. is a horror, but that's just yeah. a horror to like the cinematic community. <laughs> like, <it> is- <laughs> It's, also, it's like teenage boy or the very old boy 
who is not a teenager preys on teenage girl. Like that's also yeah. in and of itself. Like Pretty he should not be in high school. He should be. Why stay in high school forever? It's just a, it's the dumbest thing. It's gross. It's weird. I know. It's I not mean, needed. We love high school so much. Mm, it's the best time. You know. <laughs> you know I'm always ready to go back. Mm, yeah, nope. I dream about it. I guess that is the horror. It's that he's stuck having to go to high school or. Or, you know, him appearing, staring at her on her bed, like, while she's sleeping. That's definitely a horror scene right there, so. Yeah. You happen to uh, partake in some vampire culture mm -hmm. yourself. Yes. Yeah, and, and that's when I started realizing that maybe it's just the type of horror that I don't like to watch is a specific type of horror. Not that I'm not a fan of horror, because the... Books I grew up with were and Rise the Vampire Chronicles and the Mayfair Witches Chronicles. And unlike, let's say, what I like to call horror light that happens on the CW, for example, because I also used to love the Vampire Diaries and stuff like yeah, that. And I am I was watching Sabrina on Netflix and like, you know, it's it's essentially it's shows with these horror elements, but what takes over mostly it's the romance and the action. That's not the case with Anne Rice. Anne Rice is straight up like, let's go horror. And I read and I was reading like Stephen King novels, too. And I guess yeah. it was oh. just easier for me to read them than watch them because I do enjoy the mystery behind horror, a horror premise. So, yeah. mm -hmm. see, turns out I'm apparently a freaking horror fan. How? <laughs> I guess as long as I'm not having to be engaging with it visually, I think it's the visuals that that really strike me and 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 just stay in my subconscious. And I and that's that's kind of where I started feeling like I wasn't a horror fan anymore because I I started watching so many different films. I think there was just a year where every every film that came out was horror. Um and and I blame Japan actually. I blame Japan for why I went from, oh yeah, I took I totally consume horror to you know what? I'm never watching this again. <laughs> Although here I am watching <laughs> it again, so I guess I'm a liar. Um, but it's because of Ringu. The ring. Yes. What a, that, what a horrifying that, experience. My gosh, I was not ready for that. I really wasn't. Like I saw the I saw the American adaptation and I thought it was scary as all hell. I literally went home to try to tell the like explain the plot to my mom and I started crying because it was just so horrific to oh, me, no. the idea of it. And I as I was talking about yeah. it, I'm like, oh my God, this movie really scared me. And then someone has the brilliant idea of saying, but let's watch the Japanese version, Ringu. And I'm like, okay, it's, let's do that. Because, you know, Hollywood oh my God, is, no. why not? It's so Holly much better slash like worse if you're yes. not a fan of horror. Exactly. I was like, you know, the thing that scared me about the ring were all the, were the visuals of it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm thinking, okay, the Japanese version it might not scare me as much because Hollywood tends to exaggerate, you know? Everything's very big and, 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 and yeah explosive maybe this will be a more quiet film yeah it was a more quiet film quietly dying inside yeah. yes like yeah it just it just blew my mind because it had it had images that the frames that they chose to include in between like in scene cuts or transitions they were just so well i guess wisely placed i hated it yeah that it was an unconscious reaction you would have the fear yeah. came from how horrifying it would be to genuinely see that in real life and how realistic it felt and how much it could actually maybe happen, even though you know mm -hmm. that it's just supposed to be a type of fantasy. Like, it just yeah. doesn't feel that way as you're experiencing it. And it, it stuck. It stuck in my soul. I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't watch these. <laughs> no more. Yeah. 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 J horror is definitely like a, a league of their own and, and, America has definitely tried to replicate on, on many occasions the the same feel and you just lose it because they're we don't have the same culture we don't have the same influences and I will say like the grudge like <laughs> the Japanese grudge is like that haunts me forever Ugh, the same thing yeah. with uh uh what is it Pulse Noroi the Curse or no or Pulse okay. Nora Noroi the Curse Ugh. that's because it's a found footage film uh yeah. but the the one where they take the pictures um and it turns out at the end that she was like on his shoulders <gasps> the whole time like that <gasps> haunts me for forever <laughs> like, those are the things that get me forever and <laughs> you're right that Japan is to blame I hate for that. creating an entire new world <laughs> no, you broke <laughs> her <laughs> Sorry. I'm so sorry. It's, uh, uh, 
let's transition to happiness. <laughs> Quick. Um, I need aftercare. <laughs> tell us what you love about anime first not just horror anime oh my god but anime in general <laughs> Happy as a safe things. space to you be can, you can't just put all those images in my head again and then expect me to jump into anime like i'm not just gonna <laughs> bring those along with me right now because that's the thing that's what that's what j-horror does it's because you know yeah. what it is the because of it's it is a different culture the sound direction and the cinematography are completely different the editing is completely different mm-hmm. so in a way you're mm-hmm. kind of trained with if you're watching an American horror film on the beats that the film is meant to have in order for you to prepare yeah. maybe for a jump scare or prepare for the horrific reveal. But in Japan, that's not like that. It just just happens. And yeah. then you have to process it afterwards. And that's when yeah. you're like with anime. Funny enough, now that we're already talking about horror anyway, the first ones that come to mind are the ones that. The, the also have horror elements and were visually striking when I started watching them. Like I saw Ninja Scroll and to me, that was a very dark anime that was uh, very bloody and unexpectedly horrific for me. Um, I saw like Samurai X or Rurouni Kenshin, for example. And it's a very fun anime, but I saw the OVAs and the OVAs, the first one, scary as all hell. And I love yeah. it. I love it because it's just so smart. It's so intelligent. The script is so good. And and if you have a horror movie with an extremely well-written script or a horror anime, then that's going to make all the difference to me. I'm going to have to watch it. Right now, I'm watching... Yeah, you have to know. Yeah, like, uh, I'm... the, The horror anime I'm watching now, well, recently was watching, but we'll get to that, is The Promised Neverland. Of course. And another one I'm watching is called Heaven Officials Blessing, which premiered on Funimation. Uh, This was it this no last year. Oh, my God. We're in 2021. Heaven Officials Blessing, which I thought was going to be a romance. It turns out that it's a romance that takes place in a world where you're following an exorcist. So (laughs) the 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 entire... Yeah, the entire episode arcs go around mysteries related to hauntings. Mm. So first episode I'm watching and I'm like, oh, cool. I'm going to watch this new fluffy anime with like romance. And it's technically a Chinese Don Hua. And I'm like, oh, excited. And it's about a ghost bride who's stealing marriage carriages and killing the brides and hiding their corpses in a temple. And you have to figure out what's going on. And then there's like a curse. And it's like. Yeah. So horror. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And there I That's am. So funny. And they do it. There's there's some ways that and I think there's something specific about horror anime that sticks with me in a way that's different from like like film, right? Like, cause, cause when we're looking at, uh, like people, there's only so much things that we can do with the human body or with like yeah. the, the cinematics that we can believe. Right. Cause like I'm watching like Ash versus the evil dead and absurd things happen to the human body and it's gory and it's crazy. And I'm like, yeah, but there's not a piece of me that's like, this is real, this is happening. And I'm like invested. Yeah. Whereas like with anime, they can do some really horrific terrible things to the human body because it's animated and it still feels real even though it's animated thank you for that <laughs> yeah no you're validated in this moment because it's very true i was even rewatching inuyasha and like i was like if this was animated like now this would easily be classified as horror there's so many things that i noticed like happen in inuyasha that happened in other anime like demon slayer or uh mm, oh, demon other slayer. things Demon yeah. Slayer. Anything that has demons in it. I mean, the entire po- point yeah. of Mao culture of itself, it's it's horror. It's yeah. You said body horror. Now I can't get out of that because now I just I'm just having a Kira flashbacks. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Body this is horror. the thing. I argue with people uh-huh. all the time that Akira is horror, and it's I horror. will fight people. I, I don't understand people who are like this is not horror. I'm like, how Please? do you look at that and not have nightmares? <laughs> Please <laughs> join me in fighting beyond the butt. On the fact that Akira is horror. Well, Most films by Satoshi yes. Khan are horror and, and, and Akira is horror. And and yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to, I will go down with that shit. I, you will bury me and it will say on my, <laughs> my tombstone will read, Akira was horror. <laughs> yes. And it was, yes. And Body I, horror. I was just, um, and this isn't what we're going to talk about, but it kind of has similar themes. Um, but I don't know if you've watched uh, Made in Abyss. 
It's like one season. It's only on Amazon, unfortunately. So sad. Evil Corp. Uh, but it, uh, unless you like buy it, whatever. But it like the the bulk of it was really like there are horrific themes. There are things that happen that are like this would be horrific if like it took place in any other world or medium or if the characters were not like these young children right and I was just like okay like the idea is that you know they're traveling down into this abyss and the farther they go it's harder to come back because things happen to your body and the first layer it's like you get dizzy or you throw up and the second layer it's like okay maybe you're hallucinating but then it's like the fourth layer is like you're bleeding from every orifice right and like that's a horrific idea right and it's like these children are like I'm gonna go explore and find my mother who abandoned me super fun time (laughs) yeah and it was like totally fine up until i i swear it was like there were sad things and horrific things happening in the last like three episodes but not until literally episode 13 which is the last one and there's no other scene like this was made like 2016 so i doubt there's gonna be a season two the 13th episode was so horrific and so traumatizing and i was like this is so rude that i have gone through an entire season knowing i'm not gonna get i was like this sucks i'm gonna i'm gonna be stuck in here forever and uh, there's no resolution (laughs) but to have that last episode that was so like out of nowhere out of nowhere was absolutely horrific and i was just like this is rude i quit i have to go i'm gonna go watch you know monthly girls <laughs> no, go. Tune. come yes. at me bro oh, God, just find this love and just deal with that right now fruits basket moment. let's go um but back yeah. to horror anime um thank you for letting me know about made in abyss you see now i'm on to my roommates because they've been trying to make me watch it for like six months now and they never told me it was horror. Mm-hmm. It is. It, it doesn't seem like uh-huh. that because it's just like a cute, it's it really like it's most like of a happy, it is fun time a cute kid then, exploring right. and there's a robot boy and it's, right. it is adorable. But right. I tell you, like, you just don't watch the end. Just don't watch episode 13 because enjoy I, was the first me- I was messed up. And this is what I do. This is what I do for a living. <laughs> like, this is my thing. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I was like, my boyfriend is grounded because he's the one who made me watch it. I was like, you're grounded. <laughs> 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 suggest things uh i'm so upset with you i can't talk to you for at least 30 minutes as i recuperate uh from the trauma well that you instilled on me so very, that, was, well that was that um but yeah. we are going to talk about specifically one horror anime that you said was your was your favorite of last year um kat could you tell us the synopsis for promise yes. neverland Promise Neverland 2019, when three gifted kids at an isolated, idyllic orphanage discover the secret and sinister purpose they were raised for. They look for a way to escape from their evil caretaker and lead the other children in a risky escape plan. True. So that's just uh, season one synopsis, because they, <laughs> they didn't talk about season two yet. Yeah, because season um, two is coming out, is out, it's actively like happening. coming, it's happening. It um, exists. Yes. It just makes me very sad. And I need to read the manga so that I know what happens. Is real, yeah. I started it. It was I'm bad at reading. Please do (laughs) definitely read the manga. Uh The Promise Neverland, first of all, it's a it's season one, I will say. I gave it uh what a golden cloud award when we were at Get in the Robot. We did this sort of end of the year ranking for our top five favorite anime. Back when The Promise Neverland came out, it, gen- it genuinely was my top anime of the year. And um, so I gave it the Golden Cloud Award and explained that to me, season one is one of the most accessible for anyone who is or isn't an anime fan to start A, watching anime and B, become invested in a genuinely great plot. I think season one yeah. in many ways is perfection from everything from the setup to the Actual cinematography and direction, the sound direction, the sound editing, the performances, the plot, the voice acting. I, I, I am mainly a sub girl, but I've heard really great things about the dub as well. And yeah. if there is one warning, and I do want to give it, is that there is questionable representation of women of color in the Promise mm-hmm. Neverland because there is a character called Sister Crone, which feels a bit like a caricature and... If you know that and come with that in mind, it won't be as jarring. I feel like that is something that they should have put a tag on because um, mm-hmm, we did yeah. have a lot of conversations and get in the robot about that one and still have them to this day on, yeah. you know, on the bot. Um, yeah. That aside, the premise is amazing. 
And I came in to watch it blindly. Like I had no idea. I had never read the manga. I hadn't even heard about the series. I only knew one thing. There are these children. They're happy in an orphanage. They love their caretaker, which is their mother in a way. Um, Not their real mother, but the mother of that house. And for whatever reason, it's obviously an idyllic existence. It's a type of utopia. They're fed really well, which already that gives you the first hint something's up. Because yeah. ain't no, look, if, if anybody's ever been in a school where the government provides food for you, uh, you know that, that food is a good not diet. Good. <laughs> that yeah, good. that food's not good. Nobody cares. So, <laughs> so if you're caring so much about the way you're raising your kids that there's like a filet mignon on the table, they had like... Legit, I don't think, I think like truffle ravioli or something. I don't know. They were feeding this, these kids really well and, and, and they were playing and physically active and studying and stuff. You start realizing that there's something wrong with the whole thing. And that's the entire mystery of it. First, discovering what's going on, which I don't know, would it be a spoiler for me to say what, like, kind of where well, it takes off an episode? Maybe one? we'll, <laughs> maybe we'll like, uh, we'll do a little bit Enter of a spoiler pause. town now, like immediately. <laughs> I'll, well, what I'll, I will say I'll steer is, clear of it. I can steer clear of it. I can kind of just. Well, I think like we can definitely order, uh, enter spoiler town because I think there's a lot to unpack. And so much of it is very specific to what is happening. And it is the first episode and, and is like the whole premise. Um, I will say anyone who has not watched Promise Neverland, please do the first season. It's so easy to go through because there it, it is so compelling. Like you really do want to know what happens next. There's this really like organic yeah. and in stressful but like in this really exciting way uh of the way that the tension is built like it, it seems like every episode is like you know where we have a plan we're gonna do this plan and then at the end it's like oh no someone already knew that plan or there's a plan that's already two steps ahead and we're in trouble and then the next episode is like we fix that so now we have a new plan we're gonna do that oh someone else has a plan you know? <laughs> and so it's like uh, this kind of constant wave where you're kind of just trying to to catch up with what is happening and in, in with your your protagonist so if you like that kind of thrill uh the characters are super lovable and charming um and the world itself is very interesting that's you know we often talk about like the manga versus like uh the the anime uh during this like series we have like especially like talking about like you should read demon slayer but that's mostly because it's like you want more because <laughs> you're like let go <laughs> whereas with, i think what promise neverland with the the manga versus the a- anime is that you get so much more of the world too and you get some more background that they're kind of skimping around in the show for season Rush two through. so we'll yeah. definitely talk mm. about that um yeah. but it, definitely at the very least watch the first season and kind of get hooked on it and then maybe you'll you know be confirmed conformed to a manga reader uh but we will now enter spoiler town uh so pause it go watch you know the episodes and then come back (laughs) just season one is required and to be fair even even if we enter spoiler town i'm still gonna keep it as unspoilery as possible because i I kind of already knew the premise or or that bit of a spoiler of episode one coming in. And I actually think it adds to the tension to already Mm, know what's coming because they're hinting at it heavily. These children are being very well fed in an idyllic environment where they're kept away from the outside world. So the entire point is clearly like the numbers on them. They've got numbers. They've got numbers. Anyone with number tattoos. It's It's very very... the island. Mm hmm. エマ。ここグレイスフィールドハウスは親がいない子供たちが住むところ。絶対忘れない。あれは無理だ。きっと逃げられる。3人だろ。あのレベルが一度に 3人ハウス史上初だって。いつか出てくんだな、ここから。12歳までにね。絶対に近寄ってはダメよ。モント森の奥の柵だけ
嘘に決まってるだろあなたたち2人昨日もう言った置いていけないここに残せば確実に殺される逃げようみんなで一緒に私は折れない決めたから変えようよ世界見つけなければ私たちが生き残る方法約束のネバーランドこれ何もんだよ中と外をつなぐもの一体何から僕らを守ってるんだろう Yeah, so you know that there's simply something going on beyond the walls of this orphanage. So let's start there. The orphanage has walls, they are in an enclosed area being raised. So I think you know where this is going in case you weren't before.、Um, yes, and they're、yeah. being well fed.、Um, <clears throat> Wink. <laughs> Plumped up, if you will.、Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so there are horrific things happening outside. And since we've already done the spoiler announcement, essentially these children are being raised kind of like cattle to be sold, right? And every time that one of the kids gets adopted and they do a celebration, they, they, they like make an entire dinner and a whole shebang about the fact that one of the kids is finally getting adopted. And please send me letters when you get to your new home, et cetera, et cetera. They only were those two cute little outfits. Little hats, oh, little briefcase. Oh, oh no. <laughs> and they do their goodbyes and they're so excited. And these are really, like, like you said, like, these are such endearing characters. These are very beautiful, naive, young, like, just sweet children. And, and,、yeah. then, and then, the, then the main characters find out what's actually happening. And from then on, it's a race to survive and how to、mm-hmm. figure out how to escape this place when. The world outside might potentially be even more dangerous, but there's no way to know. But yeah, the world、yeah. inside is already deeply dangerous because it turns out that the people who are raising you, first of all, they're adults. So, and this is not one of those anime where you feel like there's a very clear disconnect from reality in, in most anime where the kids are having to solve everything and adults are kind of useless. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, but yeah. it's true. It's yeah, like, it where <laughs> most anime would not exist if the parents showed up.、Yeah. That's all I'm saying.、Yeah. <laughs> Where、yes. are the parents? Never there. <laughs> But here, there are no parents. There's only、yeah. the caretakers who are adults and they're intelligent adults, adults with an agenda.、Mm-hmm. So when you start and you're following the POV of the main characters, and one of the biggest advantages this series has is that it's an ensemble cast. So even though you're introduced to a main character, sort of speak, which is Emma, technically you're also following. Everybody else, and potentially、mm-hmm. some secondary characters who jump into the limelight later on. Like, slowly throughout the series, as you go on with the episodes, more kids become in, like, part of the plan to escape and find out how to survive. And they each kind of get their own motivations, their own secrets, their own mysteries. Like, not,、yeah. it, it isn't just that things are not what they seem, it's that nobody is who they say they are either. Yeah. So,、mm-hmm. you never、yeah. know who's on whose side. And plots are happening to try to escape and they get thwarted, but the obvious person might not be the person responsible. And you don't、mm-hmm. necessarily know until like later on. And, and that's just, it's just fantastic to be pulled along for that kind of ride when you don't know anything. So I would definitely highly recommend watching the anime season one first in its entirety and just enjoying that straight up because it is a masterpiece. It is perfectly executed first episode to last. And then after that, you can make a choice. You can jump. <laughs> Into season two and experience that, which is its own thing right now.、Yeah. Or you can decide to read the manga instead, and you will have a completely different story to enjoy and read. And both、mm-hmm. of them have their pros and cons. And I am, well, I don't know if luckily familiar with both or not, but, but I'm definitely familiar with both. And I, I, I definitely have some strong emotions about both of them. But yeah, like season yeah. one, perfection. Like, watch that with anyone you want. Someone says they're not into anime, ps, make them watch The Promise Neverland. Someone says, into horror,、yeah. make, make them, them watch, watch The Promise Neverland. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> And here、yeah. I am. So you see? It converts you. you. Yeah. It's like, it's so f- beautifully like, done, too. It uses colors in a perfect way that's very like, It creates this kind of eerie warmness. There's like all these light and darkness. Like in the shadows, it's all dark. The light is very like centered on them. The music builds tension. But there was something that I watched a YouTube video called Why is Promise Neverland So Horrifying by a YouTube channel called Kato. And he pointed something out to me that I totally didn't even realize is that, like, I don't know, Gabe, if you remember our conversation from individual. In- Invisible Man, where the camera、oh, yeah. was like stalking、no. them. 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where basically, yes. So their camera itself is spying on the main character. And you actually get that totally in Promise Neverland where it always looks like someone's kind of like sneaking up Around behind a bookshelf, watching them kind of make their schemes. I like totally didn't notice it till I watched this video. And it basically really works for horror in that like you kind of get this feeling that's done through the shots that make you very aware that nothing is safe, that anyone could be watching you, that basically all, all your moments where you think you're like able to make a plan and safe aren't mm-hmm. real and someone is spying so i just thought that was really cool and they also use i don't know if it's actually the kubrick scare but you, like you look up through your eyebrows they, they do that do a, lot, a lot or make the eyes yeah. as yeah. someone who's like drawing a webtoon i was like this is so helpful to express fear is making the eyeballs very tiny i had no idea and now i do so it was like it was very helpful <laughs> in that way too but it's so scary yeah, and, and so scary. one of the things about those camera angles, too, is that it's not just done for effect. It's done because there might mm-hmm. potentially be specific characters doing the spying, and you never know who's the camera at that point. Because some, I think some yeah. anime, if they apply that, if a director applies that, you assume at the end of it that it was the villain all along and that there's only this mm-hmm. one villain. But in mm-hmm. The Promised Neverland, because there are so many things happening, there are so many kids, there are two sisters, well, one mother and a sister at one point, like there are so many different characters who could potentially be spying or spotting things. It's never clear who is the one spying what. So some scenes get seen by someone and then mm-hmm. others are someone else. And it all unites perfectly for the big reveals or the big, yeah, yeah, you know, like, yeah, like disappointments or whatever. And that's so great. I saw I saw this other analysis. Uh, well, actually, I really love her analysis of Best Girl's Basement. Um, and she's also obsessed with the Promised Neverland, and she has some really great anal- like an- deep Very dive cool. analysis videos on it. Um, and and one of the things that I remember she pointed out was precisely that even the use of elements in specific scenes is on purpose. Like if you thought you saw an, uh, a fruit on a plate in one scene, and then they're still having a conversation, but the fruit is gone, those are the indicators that these that are happening at here. different times. Uh-huh. Or that this is happening because someone took the fruit. Yeah. Like every little detail is meticulously planned. It's not, there's not a single accidental element within the frame of season one. It's just yeah. really great. When art's intentional, that's like so exciting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's also like, cause it's a reflection of how like there isn't just a, a plain one answer to it as well. Like there's not just like one type of villain and then you have your heroes, like you were saying. It's also like that this is a very complicated scenario, right? It's like, do we choose the devil that we know mm-hmm. uh, or do we risk whatever is out there? And it's like, and then yeah. we don't know enough, right? And it's like, who? how do, how we can't save everyone or can we? Like, or, you know, what is doing, like, who do we trust? Who don't we trust? Because everyone is wrestling with those decisions. It's even to the point of like, who do we tell? Because Mm -hmm. we know that if we add another mind to our puzzle, then we're risking like someone also not being on our side or not being able to contribute. And so we only have these three people that (laughs) that we're working (laughs) with. And that's already a challenge. Like we don't even know what we're doing. Um, And that was like, it's so exciting because, you know, we talked last week um, in our Demon Slayer episode about the complexities of seeing the other side or like understanding and, and not necessarily empathize, empathizing, but like at least understanding where a villain is coming from. And mm-hmm. I think you, you kind of get that a little bit at the end of season one, where we kind of, we get a, a glimpse into Isabella, the mother and mm-hmm. what her life was like. And even with sister crone, um, we got to see like what, she went through and what was going on there where we're like, I was like, you are not making me sympathize with this woman. Like how, how can you put me like, she is the villain. I'm so stressed right now. Like, how did you get from A to B? But, but it's so not? understanding. Exactly. It's like so understanding for that. Um, and Kat you had know, this like really good point about, of what these villains represent. Yeah. So basically I see the predicament that Isabella and sister Carter put into is just like, you're, kind of fit with this reflection of what is self-preservation versus like what is right. So you have like Emma and the children who are very like way more altruism is their thing. Like they are okay Mm -hmm. sacrificing themselves for the better of each other where you have Isabella who is very much self-preservation. I would argue even like reflectively on sister Crone, she is more altruistic than I thought. Like 
initially. I was like, wow, she really was like put in the pen and the thing. Like, you know what I mean? Like she was like really doing some stuff to like help the kids. And I did not realize that until season two. And even though like it's probably different in the manga, but I was like, what? (laughs) I thought she like I knew she was struggling, but I had no idea like she was like really helping to the extent that she did. Um, But you really have this like reflection on humanity of like what kind of people will use self-preservation to survive, like literally just for the sake of surviving. And like people who are more altruists use altruism, which I'm probably using the word wrong, but uh, who will like try to take care of other people at the own expense of themselves. Um, And you kind of like see that with the kids versus Isabella. You also have like this idea that like you have like Ray, who is very much like we can't save everybody. And like that's a very pragmatic or like logical way to look Mm -hmm. at the situation that's horrible. And then you have Emma, who's like, absolutely not. And you have Norman, who's like on the edge. So it's kind of like I remember watching that one movie game. I forget what it's called. It had all the teenagers. They're all Gen Z murder time. All the Uh, assassination nation. Yes, Assassination Nation, where um, you basically have, like, I totally lost my train of thought. Why does that sound like Battle Royale? (laughs) It it wasn't quite like that, but towards the end, it's a little bit of that Assassination Nation. Kat, another part of that element, too, is, like, the age of them, too, um, Mm -hmm. specifically because, like, even with Emma and Ray being the same age, right, or relatively the same age, Ray remembers He's known his whole life. Yeah, so he, he... because he remembers, he in a way is older, like his memory is older, right? And he has seen the world for what it is and kind of is influenced by that. So I think there's there's a little bit of that too. It's just like there's a purity with Emma as well and some of the other kids she that has are hope. just like, yeah, like you, the world hasn't messed you up enough. <laughs> like you haven't seen just quite how evil it is to get messed up enough. But I will say she does seem to <laughs> persevere she, even after she's getting. She channels that to find older kid anxiety. <laughs> that I related to very hard when you're like the weight of everything and expectations and survival are all here and I don't know what to do with them except for to just keep going and yeah. hope that everything I'm doing is enough because if it's not like literally people will die and that's like really stressful but I, I think I it's very that. human yeah yeah I, I, and, and continuing your point, which I wasn't sure if that was your point or not, but it gave me a point now um, <laughs> of presenting these three characters where all three of them have a completely different outlook. Um, I think that's very successful in placing you in a position as a viewer to decide what's your outlook on the situation mm-hmm. as well. Because yeah. it's actually harder to relate to Emma sometimes because you feel that her optimism is naive. But in fact, yeah. that naivete, which I think we kind of shrug off after a certain point in our lives, because we mm-hmm. are kind of fed up with the world. And I mean, look, we're living in a pandemic. I get it. We're, um, yeah. we're, t- we're tired. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> that optimism is exactly what is needed to galvanize a group. So even yes. if technically Ray and Norman are the smarter kids, they're the more logical kids. They understand the potential outcomes and the risks. And they're more like prudent about it. And Emma's just willing to just go freaking forward. It's her spirit that manages to inspire them to move forward and therefore the rest of the kids to move forward. So sometimes you really just need that kind of blind optimism. If that character were missing from the promised Neverland, I doubt that they would ever be successful in breaking out because otherwise you overthink it too much. And sometimes you just can't overthink it. You gotta go for it, regardless of the risk out there. So I think that's really cool. I remember the thing, and you, your point is totally what I was trying to say. So it's perfect. Uh, we <laughs> share a brain cell because we're Gemini's. Mind jumping yeah, to your that's brain. What it is. That's what it is. <laughs> but it, uh, in Assassination Nation, there's this thing where they say there's like 10% of the world is good, 10% of the world is bad, and the rest of the 80% can be swayed in either direction. Mm. So it's like this idea that, you know, people will be selfish, but if they're persuaded to not be inherently selfish and self-preservation like they will lean towards good if there's someone like emma who is like blindly optimistic and like a very charismatic leader and like can convince them that good is the path that they need to be taking instead of like the temper other 10 percent that's like isabella who's like i just need to survive like i don't care who dies i don't care what i give up And that's very human in and of itself. Like there are lots of people who think that way, even though it sucks and like results in lots of pain and awfulness. But there are lots of human beings in our world. The world would not exist how it does if 
people didn't feel that way, um, who would like probably relate to Isabella, even though she is like 100% the villain in the scenario, but she is very much just trying to make the best out of a horrible situation for only herself. But yeah. still, yeah. I mean, I yeah. well, she didn't have for an her. Emma. You know, I, yeah. I cried for Isabella. Like this is one of the few yeah. anime where I felt by the end of it, by the end of season one, at least, that regardless of how, honestly, whether justifiable or not, I'll put in quotation marks because I, you know, that's up to everyone to interpret. Um, yeah, Isabella's evil. Be- the catalyst for it and the reasons behind it once these things were presented along with the humanity that led her there whether it was weakness whether it was self like self-preservation because these are these are weaknesses that are inherent to our makeup our dna Mm -hmm. like we we don't have the ability to just choose to not survive that easily (laughs) like yeah we we are wired to to try to survive and the situations that she gets placed in in order to make those choices once you see them I was like, I understand that right now yeah. I need to hate you and you're the villain. But holy, yeah. this is but sad. But she's a victim too. Yeah, this like is she's so a victim sad. Too. It's amazing. And then you start wondering because the season one frames it that way. Okay, so maybe even though evil things are happening in this orphanage, evil things are happening in this, well, essentially child farm. Um, yeah. It's the world outside that's to blame. The, the things yeah. that are happening out there. And then... You, now you're coming into season two, and I'm not going to go too deep into it, but whether it's the manga or the anime, the whole point is that you get to meet the wider world, and then you're pressed, you're going to be presented with even more complex situations where even yeah. the outside world might be far more removed from black and white versions of good and evil than, than you originally thought. So yeah. in that sense, it's very smart. And I will say this, if you do decide to jump into the manga, uh, word of note, the author was given a time frame to complete the manga, and then that time frame was shortened. So, Oof. and that whenever that happens, I always get a little bit worried with the manga and the plot. Stick with it; it's still good, but you can tell at some points that there was a wider story that she wanted to tell. And whether or not we get it in the end, we don't know. And the anime just decided to completely go in a completely different direction. So imagine that there are two different series. If you jump into season two of the anime, uh, starting from, I think, episode three, four, around there, um, you're watching a different story. It's not at all what the author wrote, but the author did approve it. So there are theories. Lots of theories. Yeah, it's it's definitely like it feels rushed. It feels like they're they don't. It, it feels to me like they're under some kind of constraints that we're not seeing. That they're they're like we have to do. Ooh, yeah. that. We have to put all the stuff here because we don't know if With we're going to be season. able to tell it all. Like, are yeah. we going to no. end up with something the, like lost? You know? They're not even <laughs> trying to tell it. Like, and and that's the part that I do want to clarify. Um, For anybody who's still keeping, like, who hasn't really kept up with what's going on there between the manga and the anime, there's a lot of confusion. If you're watching the anime, it is going to feel rushed. It does uh, kind of diverge away from the manga. But it's not necessarily because the studio is trying to rush the story in order to complete a season two and then three. Because that's something that, that I think would be the most natural assumption. But there are more things at play. The manga already ended. And the story being told in the anime is almost like an like an alternate an alternate story. It's gotcha. not oh, the okay. same story at all. So it's it's more like the production studio and the current and uh, showrunners for the anime have decided to tell a different version of the same story. But it's more budget related than that. They oh, are okay. not going to have. Um, it would it would really take a miracle or a very big sudden audience for a studio to justify the amount of money they need to spend to actually mm. develop all of the arcs in the manga because there's they skip three arcs in season two and they're long and they're complicated and they're difficult yeah. to animate like they're not yeah. simple plot things like these are essential to world building and essential to like there are action scenes in there that I th- I feel in the hands of the right director. Mm. Like, <clears throat> like that would just be like Studio Mappa, come at me. Um, yeah. But, but I don't, I, I don't think it would make sense for any studio right now to invest in this series the way it would require, based mm-hmm. on the audience it has, 
Like, I get it. It's more, it's probably more of a financial decision, but maybe I'm just being theoretical here as well. Like I, I'm speaking out of my, yeah. I'm not talking to the studio personally, um, <laughs> yeah. but there were some tweets that the production though. staff released where they were discussing the fact that yes, the author approved this route. This isn't something we came up with on our own, but they've had to kind of go in a different direction so that they can tie up the story differently. Plus, Unlike the manga, where they get to be a little bit more gory and a little bit more, um, I would say, hardcore with some things, the mm -hmm. anime okay. itself presenting those visuals, uh, m there might be some problems with the type of audience that they're marketing it to because it is yeah. a children's story being marketed to children. And the manga goes there. Like the manga shows you, and I think we've already, you know, implied that these, these kids are cattle. The manga yeah. shows you what that looks like, like yeah. visually. And it is striking. The manga is horror. Mm -hmm. yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was one of the things that really struck me too was because I started reading it after I, I had already started watching season two. And I was like... Oh, <laughs> we we I think like didn't even mention what the other like areas look like, what the other orphanages look like, and and what those kids who are not as smart and beautiful as you are are being treated like. And it's it definitely oh, is like no. a representation of like how you know how do we treat animals now, right? Like uh -huh. how do we treat our oh, chickens no. now? Yeah, it's exactly yeah. Oh, like that, no. and it's it's mm -hmm. definitely like a. a it, you thought it was hard-handed that, yeah. Like oh, if you thought the, than, okay. the yeah, if you thought the orphanage was cruel, know this: those are the no, that's nice. Those are the Kobe beef of kids. Mm -hmm. You know, like Kobe yeah, beef is raised where they're, they're given sake baths and massaged, yeah. so yeah. that you get that marble. <laughs> yeah, but the rest of the kids are <clears throat> McDonald's. Yeah, and and exactly oh. that, and I think like that's what I, I really enjoy about like when we get to glimpse like when you're reading manga versus like anime because anime is beautiful like the art style is striking and there are things that you're learning and you get to dive into these worlds but mangas can really like the same with books right it's like we can spend more time like I there I can never I will never say that there is a Stephen King adapted film that is more impactful to me than a Stephen King novel <laughs> like they're like those <laughs> things stick with me because they're just so deep and there's no way that there's going to be a film that's going to hit me the same way just no and the same thing with this like I feel like the the manga is because it can like you said it can go there and it does uh but we get to see more of the world we get to spend more time with the world because that's what that medium allows and the same thing with like b-stars like I love the b-stars manga and I just love like spending all that time in that world and hearing about all those little things and also being like I'm so glad I'm a vegetarian <laughs> for both of these scenarios. Um, but like, I, I'm not going to get that same, like I still love the anime and I, I love the, you know, the animation of it and the, just the direction of it as well. It's just not going to be the same as when you're spending time with those characters for a long time and you get to glimpse into the rest of it. Um, but I think with, with this and, you know, thinking of like Demon Slayer from last week is that Emma is one of those, our new, you know, protagonists that, you know, like Yudoya mentioned in a Get in a Robot video that are altruistic, that are sweet at the core. And that's what's like driving them. And Ray and uh, Norman are our traditional heroes that we have seen. Like they are like what we were saying the Hashira were, where they're like, okay, bad <laughs> yes. things have happened. So we have to fight back. And that's just the answer. And we just like, whatever happens, happens. We're just, we got to get out. We got to do it. We got to be strategic. And Emma's like, no, but we got to love and take care of everyone. This is our family. <laughs> like, you know, we <laughs> yeah, like good. we need I'm to make everyone time. survive, not just two or three or whatever makes sense mathematically, et cetera. Mm -hmm. She's like, no, we either all die or, you know what, you guys can Are choose to live? survive on your own, but I cannot live with myself with the choice of yeah. leaving anyone behind. And that somehow works. Like, yeah. yeah. Works. It, it doesn't always work. It's so emotional. But it's it's really great. I do love that new wave of, as you say, like empathetic characters, just characters who are showing that be, empathizing with the humanity of everyone around you, whether villain or not, is yeah. is important. Um, mm -hmm. That people are complex. And I, I and, hope, yeah. yeah, I hope they continue with that because it's it's just a really nice trend to see, and I think we definitely need it now more than ever. We're definitely not in a in a place I think in in, in our <laughs> in our current generation's lives where um, not having empathy is is going to help us. Yeah, and yeah. I think that you know the newer, like we we mentioned, like the newer generation 
are are more empathetic than I think most generations before them. And so it's it's nice to have and it could be because of these these anime, like maybe, you know, we'll have, you know, kids in the future who will be even more pure and sweet because they're watching heroes that are pure and sweet and they're not like, I don't have to yeah. just punch to punch because I am the best at it. I will punch <laughs> because I'm gonna save people and I'm not gonna risk other people's lives because I'm, that's not my job. <laughs> I mean to be fair, we're talking about the Tide Pot Challenge generation. So let's not give it that much credit. <laughs> <laughs> they get a little more credit, a little more credit than that. Uh, we're all we're, good. We're all Brad. We're all everything. We have the potential to be anything. It's It comes yeah, down yeah. to the choices individually yes. we make, which is um, great. <laughs> yeah. Kat, do you have any last thoughts about Promise Neverland? The show was really effective for me emotionally, even though it like wasn't as good, arguably. But like I was just like, I've cried twice and I don't... <laughs> understand why you're taking these sweet babies and making them all sad and just like let people be okay and that's not what the show is gonna do that's not what the manga is gonna do because the world sucks and it's awful it's and that's what we do people are trash <laughs> demons are trash emma. everyone's we have emma. trash yes we have emma as long as we have emma we have a little bit of hope we have a little bit yeah. of of you know a light at the end of the tumble to someone to hold for. everyone accountable for their to remind them selves. to be yeah. a person yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> um well uh just for anyone who wants to uh catch up with you crystal marie where can they find you so you can definitely find me first on our anime club channel beyond the bot Again, we used to be getting the robot, but now we are beyond it. So beyond the bot on YouTube and on Instagram, where we're also doing um, IGTV series originals and on Twitter, where all of the hosts take a day to pilot the Twitter. Um, and by the way, we did we do drunk anime reactions on IGTV. And the next <laughs> one I have slated is for Elf and Lead. So a freaking horror again. So you see, they hate me there. <laughs> There's a vendetta. And yeah. um, so the horror saga continues. Um, yeah. I've never watched Elf and Lead for the very, for that very reason. I knew that it had horror elements. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to watch that. Nah. I like the song, but that's it. But here, I'm yeah. going to have to. Such a good song. Guess who challenged <laughs> me? Dory. That's right. The person who was on this podcast. I blame you directly <laughs> now. <laughs> so, yeah, go ahead and find me there crying, essentially. Um, and you can also find me. Everywhere on the internet, I am Cristal Marie with an I, so C-R-I-S-T-A-L-M-A-R-I-E, because my mom was feeling fancy and went for a Marie in French. I don't know. She was reading a novel. Um, so yeah, you can definitely find me everywhere <laughs> at Cristal Marie, and I'm also doing The Twist and Midnight Geek Diner. But definitely just go to my Twitter or my Instagram. That's where I most spend most of my time hanging out, and we can just talk about it, talk about horror, mm-hmm. talk about crying about horror. Check out your TikTok. Oh, well, yeah. I, I watch your TikTok. Oh, yeah. I'm on TikTok. <laughs> also, Crystal Marie. So <laughs> I like took all the real estate, guys. Don't even try me. I got Crystal yeah. Marie on Twitch. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It was, it's been such a blast uh, to hear you and to, to enlighten you to your own truth. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you right now. <laughs> thank you. Yes. You are. <laughs> we can Fine. Fine. Yes. We can watch a horror film together sometime, maybe. But okay. with uh, that being said, Kat. Don't get married. Don't get your kids. kids. <laughs> okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>